Okay, the YouTube stream should be live and we're good to go. Good. Okay, good. So, um, so we first welcome to, uh, to this session of ICAO. Uh, thank you everyone for, for attending. Uh, so we'll start the discussion. So the first paper in the session is Faster Random KNF Satisfiability by Andrea Lincoln and Adam Yedidia. And Andrea is representing the team in, in the session. So please, uh, Andrea, go ahead and say a little bit about the paper. I, I'm sure you have all watched the video, the great video, but you can, you can say a few words and then we'll take, take the discussion from there. Yeah, so uh, what's going on is random case ANF satisfiability is an average case problem where you're given a particular distribution uh, for KCNF. Um, and th this distribution is basically like, if you imagine you know, having an M length uh, formula, so each, you know, I've got M clauses and each have K variables, um, you can imagine like choosing every single literal uniformly at random. So not only like what variable I'm putting there, but whether I'm negating it or not, I I'm just choosing uniformly at random for every single entry. Um, and it turns out from some previous work, uh, Ding, Sly, and Sun, um, if you like vary the number of clauses you have, you know, so if you're varying this M, like as some constant times N, you get this thresholding behavior. Um, this was like hypothesized to be true before, but was proved by Dingsla and Sun. Um, and with the thresholding behavior, what, what I mean by that is um, you start out, if you have very few clauses, with it being the case that you're satisfied. Uh, so you're, yeah, you're, this formula is satisfied with high probability. And if you have too many clauses, you're unsatisfied with high probability. And this might not surprise you because you're going from something that's roughly under constrained to something that's over constrained. Um, but there's a threshold where this changes. Um, and right around there, it's not clear how to get significantly faster algorithms for SAT. There's nothing that violates Seth, for example. There's no polynomial time algorithms. Um, and in this paper, uh, we improve upon the uh, prior work of Ryan Williams and, uh, sorry, one second. Uh, and, uh, of Williams and Vias, um, <coughs> sorry, uh, of Williams and Michael Vias, uh, which gets an algorithm uh, which runs in two to the one minus log k over k times n time. Uh, this log k over k, there, there's constants there. Um, and we instead get something that runs in two to the one minus log squared k over k uh, times n time. And the, the core idea of this algorithm is basically noticing the fact that uh, it's nice to find things that are a small hamming distance away from the true satisfying solution. And also things that are a small hamming distance away from the true satisfying solution to your SAT formula will satisfy a lot of clauses, like an unusually high number of clauses. And so you can use this as a sort of test uh, to like, check whether or not you should further explore the area to try and find your satisfying assignment. And that's the... Okay, well, thanks Andrea for the short summary. Um, so uh, I think there is one question that was asked on Slack, but maybe before we take that one, uh, we can just open up the floor and see if anybody else from the audience have questions. Oh, I have a question. The alternative hypothesis would be that the Yes. Ah, okay. Where Can you show the existence of solutions the using this idea? Oh, like, for example, can you show that in, in the real very algorithm work that actually works with high probability to find the solution? Very, very simple. Uh, so just to repeat your question to make sure I understood yeah, it, you were asking if we like actually produce a solution or are you asking about the practicality of it on real problems. Um, yeah, I'm asking if you can show that you will produce a solution with high probability. Yes, yeah. mm. yeah, so uh, if there is a solution defined, you will find it with high probability. Um, and this algorithm, like, uh, this algorithm returns false unless it returns a solution. So, you know, it has, it has one-sided error where, like, it, it 
any time that the, you actually can't find, a, like there, there is no solution. It won't say that you found one. So, so you still rely on the result of uh, Ding's science and where you need that there will be a solution and then you... Um, you know, this question... This isn't really hinging on Ding's lion sun so much for, for this result. Uh, it's more, uh, we basically like are using the fact that everything looks like a binomial. Like, <laughs> um, and you can just sort of say that like, you're gonna succeed as long as you're not in the tail of this binomial. That's like morally what we end up doing. Um, yeah. So this, so your algorithm works exactly at the threshold. It means that when you sample an instance, half of them will have a solution and half of them will not have a solution? Ah, so uh, we don't actually know what probability there is that you have a solution uh -huh. or don't have a solution if you're at the threshold. Um, it's also the case that this, uh, so we work not just exactly at the threshold, but around the threshold, we, we prove that we work. Um, and you can probably use the techniques from the previous paper of Nikhil Vyas and Ryan Williams to like show that you, we continue to work outside of the threshold, but we, we haven't actually done that. And so, you know, it's, it's not in the paper. I can't, I can't like assure you that that's definitely true, but uh, this sort of, you should be able to get this running time everywhere. I see. Um, it, would, it be, would it be the case that the farther you are from the threshold, then you would expect the faster the algorithm to get or? Yeah. Like to some extent, like if you get far enough away from the threshold, you can start even using like these poly like previous polynomial time algorithms. Um, uh, like you, you will want to stop using our algorithm at a certain point because sort of baked into it is some assumptions about like how uh, formulas behave with respect to Hamming distance and those assumptions break down if you're not like in a particular region of space, but it's okay because you can use these other algorithms and you know, they run quickly enough that it's not a problem. Okay, uh, is there any other question from the audience? Um, so maybe we can go over the question that was asked on Slack. Marvin typed it into the chat box, but let me read it. So the question is whether uh, asks about the practical complexity. Sometimes algorithms with better complexity run slower than others with worse complexity and whether sort of you have tried to experiment and see if that's the case. So uh, we have not experimented with, let me say like truly practical formulas that is like asking, I don't know, Microsoft for the kinds of formulas that they plug into uh, their stuff. Um, but we have in fact run experiments where we like generate random formulas via these methods um, with relatively small n and k where our, our algorithm is actually not proven to work particularly well for small n and k of course it's for large um, large values but even on these small values um, it, it works quite well and the sort of generic statements that we make are true so uh, we actually have a picture that shows up in the paper itself which is generated by producing a random formula <laughs> with like k equals four and n equals like 10 or 15 or something um, and exhaustively finding all solutions in this space and then histogramming out like what everything looks like. Um, and, and these sort of statements about Hamming distance hold true even on these random formulas. I hope that answers the question. Um, okay, well, we don't have a... Uh... The person who asked the question here, so I think we'll have to take yes as an answer. Um, so uh, I think we have a maybe another minute or two if anyone wants to discuss anything else. Uh, yeah, I would have a question, um, namely, so um, your your algorithm is a result of uh, having this kind of uh, trade-off uh, algorithm, and you need a good um, estimator for this to to get the trade-off, right? Yes. And so then you analyze it to get this log squared k over k sa uh, savings. Right. Um, is there some intuition that this should be really also the true answer for this estimator? Uh, could the analysis be Im uh, improved? Um, or can you also maybe say something about the intuition be in, uh, behind the log squared and k savings? Yeah. So. Um... 
I think a better estimator should exist and there should be, uh, like, I don't think log squared should be the like right answer overall. Um, for this estimator in particular, uh, it's not obvious that our analysis is tight. Um, I do think it's probably the best you can do with this estimator. Um, and roughly the reason for that is like, we're doing about as well as you can hope given that what we're like doing is like losing. If really all you're looking at is whether each clause individually is true or false, I'm not like doing anything pairwise between the clauses or doing anything more special. We sort of like lose information as we get farther and farther away from the original SAT assignment, um, just because like you start looking random pretty quickly because it starts to be the case that, you know, every entry is like flipped too much for lack of a better phrasing. Um, I, this, isn't, this isn't a very good intuition, uh, but like roughly you sort of should expect the information to be lost and it sort of like does look like it's lost around the time you, you hit where we claim you sort of can't get better. Um, but like I said, that's not, that's not like very coherent. Um, I, I think if you like for hoping to improve upon this, I think the most obvious thing is we really don't do anything um, in terms of noticing any kinds of correlations or relationships between clauses. And I think there's a lot of sort of very basic things you can do along the lines of like, I bet things that are better look more true. <laughs> I bet there's sort of similarly basic statements that you can make that get interesting results with pairs of clauses. Um, I haven't found them otherwise, I guess I would have published a follow-up paper, but like, <laughs> um, I, I do think that that's like an important lack in this paper. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Andrea, and thanks for the question and for the very nice discussion. Um, we'll have to stop here and take the rest of the discussion offline, as we usually say. So, um, um, so let's move on to the second paper of the day. So the second paper is um, of this session is um, sparse recovery for orthogonal polynomial transformation by Anna Gilbert, Albert Gu, Christopher Ray, Atri Rudra, and Mary Wooters. And we have both Albert and Atri representing the paper here. So can either one of you uh, uh, sort of uh, com come and say a few words about the paper? Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Albert. Um, yeah, I'll give a brief summary of the paper. So the problem we consider is the sparse recovery problem, which is um, in a nutshell, you are given a fixed uh, transform, a linear transform, um, which you can think of as say an N by N matrix. And you are, you're trying to compute um, a transform, which is basically matrix vector multiplication by this fixed matrix. Um, and we're interested in the case when the output is known to be sparse or approximately sparse. Um, in this case, we want algorithms that are that run um, polynomial in the sparsity of the output um, with log n factors. So a typical example of this would be the sparse FFT uh, or fast Fourier transform, the most famous example. Um, and a, a particularly interesting property of uh, this one is, well, the way the sparse FFT algorithm is usually presented um, or the intuition behind it is it's um, supposed to be like a black box reduction where you uh, kind of reduce this case sparse output. Um, what you you find one index at a time, and kind of reduce it to the one sparse recovery problem. Um, so you want to reduce it to a one sparse recovery problem, find one entry of the output, and then peel it off. Um, however, although this is the way it's usually talked about, um, actual algorithms for this don't actually really do that, um, and they rely a lot on heavily on specific properties of the Fourier transform. Um, so in our work, we consider actually more general classes of these um, recovery, these, uh, these linear transforms. Um, and in particular, we consider classes of orthogonal polynomial transforms, um, which more generally is when your transform matrix is uh, 
a matrix of evaluations indexed by polynomials on one axis and um, some evaluation points on the other axis. Um, and this is surprisingly general. So it covers like um, the FFT and a lot of variants such as the cosine transform, Legendre transforms and so on. Um, and so the first main contribution of our work is that we show a black box reduction from the case sparse recovery problem to the one sparse recovery problem, uh, which is truly black box. So you can solve a, a one sparse problem and then peel off the answers one uh, iteratively. Um, and then we also show a one sparse recovery problem for a very large class of transforms called the Jacobi polynomial transforms, um, which include basically um, all of the transforms that people previously considered or care about. Um, now, one uh, one the, the main drawback or caveat of our algorithm is that our black box reduction from k sparse to one sparse uh, requires an assumption on the um, that the the k sparse output is the support of this is sort of spread out, or um, we incur a factor in an algorithm that depends on how spread out they are, and so there is a technical problem that. Um, if we could find a, a way to overcome this, we'd be able to overcome that, but we, that's the main open question left. Um, and I guess the, the main idea behind this reduction is using specific properties of orthogonal polynomials, which is, I mean, using their orthogonality, um, you can find these filters that sort of um, do the reduction from k-sparse to one-sparse, um, which involve finding polynomial filters called boxcar polynomials. Um, it's pretty hard to describe this verbally, so, uh, but we have a lot of pictures in our slides. So, yeah, I think that's a summary. Um, Audrey, if there's anything you want to add. Nope, sounds good. All right. Okay, uh, thanks. Thank you very much for the summary. So we already had one question on Slack by Hari Laos Zisopoulos, who I believe is in the audience. So Hari Laos, would you like to ask the question? in person. Um, or maybe we can just read it off if, uh, uh, okay. So yeah, so it, it's typed in the chat box, So, but let me read it. So it's about, uh, 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 about, uh, about the bound. So it says you mentioned the soft K log and lower bound for the noise free case. Uh, so, uh, and that you also did not specify the polynomial exponents for your algorithm running time. Are you aware or do you suspect a similar lower bound for the noisy case? And so, and how, how does the actual performance of the algorithm relate to this bound? Uh, I can take the easier version of the question, which is, do we believe our thing is optimal? And the answer is an emphatic no. Uh, so for example, um, one case where the support is separated is if the support is completely random. So you expect like a fractional one over k squared separation. And there our runtime is like k to the eight, which is no. Um, um, it is so it's nowhere being closed. We do believe that something like k log n like soft o is probably still the right answer uh, for say Jacobi's. Um, but we don't know how to, so there's the other issue of what evaluation points you use and it kind of gets a bit tricky. Um, we might be able to prove like something like K log N if we choose slightly different evaluation points than the one that we consider uh, more particularly these, if you, so these are points between minus one and one. And so if you think of it's cosine of an angle, um, that these angular values are not uniformly distributed for the versions that we are. We suspect if they were uniformly distributed, so you'll get something that is close to orthogonal, but not quite orthogonal, that you might be able to show something like K log N. Um, so I don't know if that answers all the question. Um, so, I mean, if you are able to show an upper bound of something like K log N, then I guess, I mean, the lower bound is also fine because it, you know, that's the lower bound. Um, I don't know if there's a follow-up question to this or happy to, okay, great. Okay, um, okay so uh, are there any other questions from the audience about this paper?
Um, okay. Well, thanks to uh, Albert and Natri for the, the for the presentation. Uh, and so we'll be moving on to uh, the third paper of the session then, which is Hard Problems on Random Graphs by Jan Dreyer, Henry Lotze, and Peter Rosmanit. And I believe Peter is here to talk about the paper. So please uh, say a few words. Um, so I believe Peter Rosmanit. Yeah, was sorry, here. sorry. I, I forgot my yes. mic to unmute my mic. So okay, then, good. Uh, okay, hello. So many, many years ago, I was thinking about on, on random graphs, everything seems easy. What is a problem that's not easy? And um, yeah, I was not so sure whether there is one, but yeah. Uh, if you look at the parameterized complexity, so I, I thought dominating set is a, is a very good candidate. And my dream was actually to prove that solving dominating set, so give me a number k, you cannot solve it in FPT time on a random graph. So that's what I wanted to prove, but, but it seems to be beyond uh, everything we can do today. So yeah, it, it, could you allow me to share my screen and I could, ah, I can, um, okay. So, so here, here, this is the, uh, these are the results we, we could prove. Um, so again, I, I would like to prove that dominating set is hard. So this was kind of not possible, but at least um, there are some results. So one is dominating set is at least, is kind of one of the hardest problems. So if you look at all problems that can be expressed in first order logic, so then um, dominating set is, is so as hard as any of the others. And also we have some robustness, yeah? So solving dominating set. So if it's easy for some edge probability on a random graph, then it's also easy for every other edge probability and vice versa. And then if, if, if you don't like graphs, a problem which has, I like very much is if you take a random Boolean matrix, an n by n matrix, and every entry is zero or one with probability one half, right? And if you look at k rows and you can take the pointwise and of them, they could be zero. On a random matrix, this is um, very unlikely. Well, this is this problem is is as hard. As, it has the same complexity as dominating set. Basically, it's it's also a very similar problem if you think about adjacency matrices. But if you change it, the problem you you you're not interested for the logical and, but for the exclusive or of the rows. Then the problem is actually easy. So these problems look look very similar. And one is hard, the other is easy. So it's, it's, it's still very open how the landscape looks like. And this, this problem with the, red, uh, with the exclusive ORs of K rows, in the worst case is actually hard. Yeah. Okay, so these are the results of our paper here. Yeah. Okay, so thanks for listening. Okay, uh, thanks, Peter, for the summary. Um, so uh, there is already one question, but it's a bit technical. So maybe we can start by taking some other questions from the audience. So Andrea, you have a question? Yeah, so there's this results from uh, Bois, Andasara, Brennan, and Bressler about uh, the average case complexity of counting k-cliques, um, where they show that uh, on erdos renyi graphs, counting k-cliques is as hard up to sub-polynomial factors um, as it is in the worst case. Um, so like... Yeah. I think I, uh, I've heard about this. Yeah, yeah, counting seems to be really a, 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 um, something where you can make more progress. Yeah, I, I guess my follow-up question was going to be sort of like, do you, what do you think the counting difficulty, the, the hardness of the counting version of 
Yeah, yeah. Counting seems yeah. to be hard already on on random graphs. Yeah. So so that's that's not what we were looking into. These these are just decision problems. But yeah, yeah. So I think. So this is my guess. Um, the most progress will be first made in, in counting programs, uh, pro problems, I guess, yeah. So it would be nice to, to have more of this, like or also in, in decision problems. I have a question. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I, I would have a okay. Yes. Uh, sorry, did Aditya want to go first? Uh, no, you go ahead. Uh, um, so I was wondering, um, are you aware of the connection of um, um, like the dominating set is strong enough to uh, solve all the first order model checking problems? Um, yes. Um, the bound and quantifier case. So in the worst case, there's this uh, completeness result of um, K dominating set and K orthogonal vectors. So K orthogonal vectors would essentially be your matrix prog problem with the logical end uh, on each row. Yes. So let me think. This, um, uh, yeah, yeah, this came up in the past. Um, there was some reason why this is uh, not the same, but, but okay, uh, let's, let's see. So, so what was exactly this result? So uh, any K plus one quantifier um, first order property can be reduced in a fine-grained way to uh, uh, the K dominating set problem in the sense that any polynomial improvement over the N to the K running time for K dominating set yes. would also give such an improvement for all these properties. Exactly. Kind of, uh, like what, what you're doing in this average case world um, is uh, in, a, in, a very in a very tight way um, uh, is known in the in the worst case setting. Yes, you're right. Um, but this was about if you if you can do this in better than n to the k, then you can also solve every problem better than n to the k. So yeah, this is true. This would would also follow from other res our results, but not the other way around, right? It's, um, it's well, uh, so so we, we say one is in FPT if the other sign FPT. Exactly. So you have some kind of a blow up also in the in this in the size of the formulas that you that you look at, right? So uh, yes. when you reduce so, to yeah, but, but it's an FPT blow up. So mm -hmm. uh, so do you have a kind of a quanti quantitative statement how, how, how large the um, blow up is? So um so our proof works with a series of reductions and most of them are kind of harmless and they have just a, a exponential factor in K. But there is one reduction step where you go to these extension axioms and then you cannot easily control how big they become. And this, you, you could analyze it, but I'm not sure whether this would become double exponential you should look into this better, but but uh, I'm pretty sure it's not worse than double exponential. Okay. Thank you. It might be exponential. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> so so um, um, it's it's because the um, finding out whether a, a, a bully, uh, uh, an FO formula is true in the limit. This is p-space complete. So basically, you should be able to do this in exponential time in the length of the formula. So it, it, it might be single exponential, I'm not so sure. But um, it's, it's FPT, the dependence. Um, there was another question, uh, Atri, I think, or who, yeah, who was? No, I, I had yes. a question. So uh, oh, is, is the notion of hardness related to FPT or? Uh, like in general, like is there something like specific you're looking for about FPT related hardness, or is it uh, good any I'm, hardness? I'm not sure whether I understand the question correctly. So, are you asking whether, um, so so we are say whether we are saying hard is if it's not in FPT or yeah, 
like it was by hardness are you specifically referring to fpt hardness or yes um yeah when i say hard i i'm i'm meaning not fpt i see okay but uh, what we're really doing are reductions so it it basically says they are all the, the hardness is the same so if, if one is very hard the others would be also very hard but for me it would be a dream to show that it's not in fpt <laughs> that would be already enough <laughs> um, yeah I, I actually i wanted to ask a quick question too so essentially i mean in your setting it's uh, most graphs uh, do not have a dominating set right so it's more like a refutation you want to show certify that a, that a graph does not have a dominating set. Uh, so I don't know, in cryptography, at least sort of a slightly harder problem is, I guess, to get a pseudo random generator. So maybe can you have some kind of distribution of graphs that have a planted dominating set, but that are indistinguishable from uh, random graphs? Yeah, this uh, is a very, very interesting direction of research, I think. It, it, in particular with a planted dominating set and using it for cryptography. I think I tried to find something in this direction, but I, I didn't. <laughs> I see. So far, but I, I think it's a fascinating area. But is there some, some sense that maybe this kind of reductions could work even in this setting that saying that there is some kind of complete uh, pseudo random generator for this class of At the moment, or... the reductions rely that the uh, distribution is, is, a, is an erdos Reni graph. It's, it's uniform. It, it, it works only for uni, maybe for a little bit others, but, but at, at, at one point the proofs might break down if you have a crazy distribution. And I think for crazy distributions, it's also not true. That, that the, um, then some problems are easy, others are hard, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so uh, let's take the question that was posted on Slack by Tobias Mumke. I'm not, I don't think he's in the audience, so let me read it out. So he said, I don't understand why A prime, A double prime and E prime become symmetric. Could you explain a bit more? So I suspect this is a reference to one of yeah, your slides. It's, it's from so the I proof. If you want to... So I can answer the question, but nobody will understand it out of context. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so if you want to have a, 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 a random symmetric matrix, one way is you just take a random matrix and use the upper right upper triangle, but ignore the, the lower left triangle and just just uh, just make it symmetric by copying everything from from the upper triangle into the lower one. Yeah, and, and okay. here in a proof we need. Yeah, it, it, it's it's a it's a reduction where you take a yeah you, you want to show that if a if a if you can solve this this um, have the this end of k row zero problem if you can solve it on the symmetric matrix then you can also solve it on a random matrix and, and here you, you, you need to, to take a random matrix, with, which, which is a yes instance and, and construct, yeah, not necessarily one, but, but maybe a, a set of, of random symmetric matrices where at least one is a yes instance. So I'm, uh, yeah, I'm sorry if this was not explained in the paper. Okay. Uh, well, anyway, thanks. Thanks for the additional <laughs> explanation. So I think, uh, yeah, we'll have to end the discussion here. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating, and we'll move on to the next paper in the slot, which uh, I need a second to remember which one it is. Yeah. So the next paper is uh, uh, dynamic averaging load balancing on cycle by Dan Alistair, Georgi Nadiradze, and Amir Sabur. 
So I believe Amir is here to present the paper. Oh, no, uh, Dan is here to present actually, the paper. Who's presenting, okay. I am doing the short version. Um, uh, um, uh, Moshtaba already did the, sort of the long version, which I invite you to have a look at. So I'll just use some slides for props, but you can also look at me if you are tired of slides. So the basic setting for our paper is like the classical kind of load balancing uh, problem where you have the stream of balls and you have a bunch of bins and you want to keep the loads of the bins kind of balanced. So in this version, we actually, uh, there's like a graphical, there's some kind of structure onto the bins. So basically you can assume that the bins are vertices on at, uh, like vertices on a graph. And then what, what you do in every step is for instance, you select a, uh, an edge, you generate a ball, and then you're going to place the ball in some kind of uh, load balancing way on, onto one of the two bins, which are endpoints of this edge. In particular, one thing is uh, that's kind of very popular to look at is this kind of power of two choices strategy where you select the edge, you look at the two endpoints and you put the um, weight into the least loaded, less loaded of the two choices. Okay, so this is, this would be, if you're familiar with kind of power of two choices, basically the standard power of two choices is the clique version of this where you can choose any pair. Whereas here you, you're uh, sort of uh, constrained by the additional topology of, of the graph, right? And this problem actually arises in kind of uh, data structure uh, uh, instances, which I can go into later if people are interested. But the, the idea is you want to bound the gap between the most and the lowest, least loaded vertices or bins on this graph. This problem has been looked at before. Uh, so in particular for better regular edge expanders, um, the gap is known to be order log n over beta. This is a result by Perez, Talvor, and Wieder. And then in the static case, there's almost tight bounds in terms of the gap, but also some convergence by Sauerwald and Sohn. So in particular for the cycle, for the case of cycle graphs, which are kind of, kind of the hardest sort of expand, expander case, uh, the best known bounds for this um, um, variant of the, for, for this kind of process is uh, impl are implied directly by the first follower and beta results where we just plug in one over N as the expansion. So basically we get um, order um, n log n as the gap between the most and least loaded bins and a lower bound of uh, omega log n, okay? So what we do in this paper is um, what, uh, what we do is we consider a variant of this load balancing procedure where um, there's like one additional trick that you do. So you have a weight sort of comes into, you sort of comes into your hand, you select the two endpoints, you select two kind of edges, these would, so you, you select an edge and it's two endpoints, and then you sort of place in the weight into kind of an arbitrary uh, bin, and then you average out the two, uh, like you average out the weights. So basically if the weights were L1 and L2, and the new weight, uh, the loads were L1 and L2, and the new weight has uh, uh, value W, then basically both of these weights are gonna be L1 plus L2 plus W over two. Okay, so we get the weight, we place it average and we're done. Okay, so this is kind of a slight uh, well, like um, modification of the original power to choices process. And what we can show in this case is that we, we show almost tight bounds for uh, the um, um, gap in this case. And uh, this kind of, the, the exact numbers are as follows. So with basically the intuition, maybe the, the thing that you wanna take away from this is the square root of n seems to be kind of the, tight threshold for this. So the upper bound is order square root of n log n for the gap. And the lower bound on the gap squared is omega n. So basically this would suggest that the actual gap is bound, lower bounded by square root of n. And I, I think, I mean, the, the, the problem might seem slightly uh, like slightly contrived, even though it, it does appear, it did sort of appear in our work and we use this as an application, but uh, the, I think the techniques are kind of interested in if you're into load balancing. So we have this kind of hot potential function which allows you to characterize the maximum gap as, as you sort of stretch the distance between two nodes. And the other um, nice trick which Moshtaba came up with is basically a way of characterizing the maximum gap in terms of like combinatorial sort of combinations of different, where basically different nodes could be on the ground. So that's, I, I would sort of encourage you to read the paper. So then just to finish up with a sort of colorful graph, 
this works. So basically it does seem to characterize what's going on in practice. These are uh, sort of simulations with increasing number of nodes between a hundred and a thousand. And as you can see, uh, we sort of divide the maximum gap or sorry, the average gap over the square root of n and it does appear to be a constant. So with that, I'll stop and uh, sort of, I'm happy to answer any question. Um, okay, so any questions for, <clears throat> for Dan and for the other authors of the paper? I ask a question. Yeah, so, uh, so is this lock needed or do you think is it root of n or root of n log n? So uh, like actually from the, I, I, we didn't know exactly how to uh, sort of uh, introduce this here, but we were able to shave a square root of n, uh, a square root of log n factor off the bound. So okay. at least the upper bound seems to be square root of n log n where everything is inside the square root. So we, we actually we should thank George Jakupis who sort of appointed us to, to the idea of uh, used to, the, to shape this uh, shape this extra uh, log factor. So I mean we believe that the actual tight bound is um, is actually square root of n, but so the sort of the log n. I mean I I can sort of describe the exact point where where we lose the square root of log n, but uh, it, so it, it seems to be just an artifact of the sort of folding we do in the technique. It, it, there's no real reason why the tight bound should be square root of n log n. May I still ask one more question? Of course. Is it, so you have this hop bound, which is linear. So I don't know, how did you call it? Is, right. is it feasible that one could try to have a generic reduction which would reduce this to the regular bound? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by um, the regular bound. No, no, sorry, I'm talking gaps, uh, square gap. So, so, so yes. we have. Oh, a... yes, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, we did, we did think about this a non-trivial amount. Like, uh, it's, it's very frustrating. It's, it's actually like, unfortunately, Jensen's inequality sort of works against us here. So, sort of just like, it, it sort of goes the wrong way. So, I. So I guess I would say, at least with, to the limits of our technique, and we did think about this fairly carefully, we were not able to, uh, like th there's like one key technical sort of uh, addition to the technique, which you would need to uh, sort of uh, make in order to characterize the gap itself. Yeah. Okay, it's, good. it's very thank unfortunate. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, maybe we have time for another quick question. So maybe one quick question. Um, sure. So uh, um, you mentioned that for grids, the problem is still open. Um, yeah, um, if you said take a, a of a cycle, you, you take a grid, right? I think in the paper- sorry, yeah. So I lost you for about like five seconds. So could you please repeat? Oh, question? sorry. Um, I think in the paper you mentioned that for grid graphs, it's still open. Yes, I think it's still open, yeah. yeah. And so at least if I think about a torus, I mean, it's just a collection of cycles, right? So yeah. it, it may not be that far-fetched that maybe some of the techniques at least can be like taken over. To right, so, so we actually, um, yeah, we, we strongly believe that you can, you can actually, um, so uh, I mean, okay, so maybe to answer your very specific question about the grid I, or the torus, I, you could use this as an kind of loose upper bound to obtain a, an upper bound for the torus. But I guess this is not what you want. Like you, you would like a tight bound for the torus. So basically we, in the paper, we actually kind of outlined the steps of the, of the technique. And we believe the technique to be fairly general, but the, the kind of the unfortunate thing is that it doesn't seem to, or at least we weren't able to tie, like there are these certain steps in the process where you need to upper and lower bound certain quantities, like for instance, the potential. And we were not able to find a simple way of tying them to known graph properties like conductance or something about the, the torus that you, you sort of, we know and you just associate the number with it and it's fine. So basically in order to get a tight bound, you actually need to characterize some like certain quantities which we, we sort of we do not relate to known, uh, to graph properties that we already know and understand. So then we had to do this manually, like upper and lower bound these quantities manually for this. And we did it for the cycle, but this turns out to be like fairly complicated even for the cycle. 
So then I think it I, actually, I think the main sort of uh, avenue for future work would be to actually maybe uh, like try to extend it to more general graphs and then see if there's maybe some additional mathematics that we can use in order to obtain like more generic bounds for different types of graphs. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank, thank you, Dan, and thank you for the questions. Uh, so uh, yeah, we have to move on to the next paper. So okay. the next one in the session is uh, paper E by Aditya Potokuchi and on it's a spectral bound on hypergraph discrepancy. And this was actually chosen as the best student paper uh, for iCalc track A. So if you haven't watched the video, you should watch the video. And uh, Aditya, please uh, go ahead and uh, tell us a bit about the paper. So can you share my screen? Uh, you I'm should be my able to. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, so, okay, I'm sharing my screen. Okay. So I'll just quickly start off with what discrepancy is. So H is a hypergraph on the vertex set N. Right? Get any two coloring of the vertex set. Let's like say this, these two colors are minus one and one. And you can extend this coloring to the edges. How just sum up the colors of the vertices and you just take the mod of the, the, the absolute value. So in some sense is the amount of imbalance between the ones and minus one that is there in an edge. The discrepancy of such a coloring is the maximum imbalance that is there in any edge. And the discrepancy of the hypergraph is the minimum discrepancy you can achieve with any coloring. So, so this is an extremely general notion. Um, the, the, what's relevant to us is we consider hypergraphs where, which are T-regular, that means every vertex is in exactly T hyperedges. And the relevant big conjecture here is uh, due to Beck and Fiala, which says that every T Okay, so this is a T regular hypergraph has discrepancy order square root T. Uh, I won't say much about this, but this is an extremely uh, difficult, seemingly extremely difficult conjecture. Uh, so a lot of attempts have been made on it. And we know something like it's at most 2T minus one. So th this is I mean, this is not exactly easy, but it, it's, 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 it's very nice. It's not quite the conjecture. Uh, we don't know much more, unfortunately. We know like th this theorem by book is also extremely difficult and it only shaves off like a log star T more. Okay, so, so this is kind of uh, the Beck Fiala conjecture is kind of the main uh, con context of what uh, I'm about to say. So, recently people have been working on random hypergraphs because to, to see if you can at least prove it for random hypergraphs. And pretty much the paper that started it was by Ezra and Lovett, which shows that the discrepancy of hypergraph is a order square root t log t. So, it's actually better than 2t minus 1 with probability that grows exponentially small in t as long as h is somewhat large enough. Uh, this was slightly improved again by Bunsel and Mika last year, which, which gets the square root T bound, but uh, requires T to be somewhat large. Okay, and uh, now I, I'll state the main result for that, like a, a bit of notation. Uh, consider the matrix where it is, it's the incidence matrix of the hypergraph. The rows are given by edges, the columns are given by vertices. And let lambda be the maximum norm of MV, where V is orthogonal to all one's vector. This is something like the second eigenvalue of a random of a regular graph. Right? So this is some some, some, kind, some kind of expansion measure. Uh, the main theorem is that the discrepancy of h is order square root t plus lambda. So this is a deterministic statement. The square root t is what the Beck-Fiala conjecture says should be true. Uh, you get plus lambda, which is the the the, the quote unquote second eigenvalue. And as a corollary, uh, yeah, you, you, this also comes with an efficient algorithm. And as a corollary, you get that if H is large enough, then the beck fiala conjecture is true. Um, and the reason it's a corollary is that for a random for a random hypergraph, this, the second eigenvalue is order square root t. Uh, and, and so, so those are the main results. Um, and the conjecture and the main conjecture I would like to uh, showcase is that if H is actually slightly smaller, uh, you get order one discrepancy here. Um, so, 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 so that's it. Um, thanks. So uh, there is one question that was asked on, uh, on, on the discussion on Slack. Uh, yes, so the question there was, could you say more about how K is chosen? So I'm not sure exactly what the, the K parameter refers to here. Uh, so me, uh, I have the regularity. You... Uh -huh. Uh, okay, if, if k is meant by t, so the, this theorem shows for every t. 
for every uh, con like, so even for constant t so uh, you yeah, you're you're right in the sense that if t gets larger it gets easier and, and this was proven in the previous results and so uh, the the main point was to make t a constant try and make t a constant um thanks uh any other questions from the audience okay so if there are no more questions thanks uh, th thank you very much for the talk aditya and uh, we have one more paper remaining in this session. So that's paper F by Uri Feige and Vadim Greenberg, how to hide a click. Um, and I believe they're both in the audience. So uh, can one of you uh, step up and say a few words about the paper? Hi, I guess I will go and step up. So I will share my screen just for simplicity. Yeah, so everyone is fine. Yeah? It's a part of the presentation. So uh, in our work with Uri, we basically study the effect of randomness on the planted click uh, problem. So the usual, the classic planted click problem is we take a random GNP graph and uh, K, where K is a parameter, random vertices of GNP are chosen and made into a click. And the goal can be like either find the exact set that we chose to plant, find maximum click, or find any k click. And if k is large enough, it turns out that the problems are basically equivalent. We study a kind of different problem. So um, yeah, we study the problem that we call adversarial planted click or adversarial maximum independent set problem. Is basically the same. So. Uh, it's almost, it's very similar to the classic planted peak problem. We take a random GNP graph, but now a computationally unbounded adversary inspects the graph and selects K vertices of his choice and makes them into a click. And now we would like, yeah, and we call the graph A, G, and PK. And we again can consider problems of finding the exact set or finding maximum click or finding any K click. And, uh, and similarly, we can study independent set problem and we can plant independent set and try to find it, or try to find any k independent set and so on. And uh, for simplicity of presentation, I will state like the three core results of our paper. So the first one, so there are three parameters in our problem, the number of vertices and the size of the click or independent set that we plant k and the probability of edge in a random graph P. So first regime is P equals constant, let it be one half, and K is uh, big omega square root of N. And we study planted, by the Rochelle planted a click problem. So in this case, there is a polynomial time algorithm that finds with high probability the maximum click of the graph. If K is at least square root of N, times some constant, and space constant. Please constant. So second regime is when P is one over N to delta where delta is between zero and one. Uh, so it's like uh, polynomially small. Uh, and K can be chosen arbitrarily. So any value of K with N, one, doesn't matter. So in this case, if we study adversarial planted click problem, we again have a polynomial time algorithm that finds the maximum Planted, maximum click in the graph with high probability, and it works regardless of what the exact value of k is. And third regime is when we, again, when our probability p is uh, polynomially small, but we consider planted independent set problem. So we have a random graph, g and p, and we plant a random, uh, and we plant an adversarially chosen k independent set on click. And in this case, it turned out that unlike in previous cases where we could find the maximum click in polynomial time, here the problem becomes hard. Precisely, there is no polytime algorithm that finds any k in set in the graph unless with constant probability, unless np equals rp. So uh, that's a quick summary of uh, our results and uh, the problem that we've studied. 
Uh, okay, thanks, uh, uh, Vadim. Uh, so um, uh, we opened the floor for questions. So if anyone has questions, uh, please yeah, feel free to ask. Let me stop sharing screen so that I can see questions. Or, or I can leave it to you. Um, yes. So do you have, if for the second result, the, the end to the order one minus one over delta time thing, do you actually need to choose a random graph or can you do with some kind of pseudo random graph? So uh, actually we, so uh, we did not try any pseudo random graphs. We just assumed that Eugene P is random, but is I think, I, I think that you don't, so um, let me think. Um, So the way this algorithm works is basically we list, so we, we show, we prove that the number of maximal clicks in the GNP, in the original GNP graph is bounded by polynomial in N and it's easy to prove. And then we show that if we choose, if we plant an adversarial K click into it, then the number of maximum, maximal clicks in the resulting graph will not be much larger. So I think the only property that you can require here is just that the number of clicks in the original graph is uh, like not very large compared to, not, not, not very large, I think. But uh, yeah, uh, but I, I, I don't know. So the random graph, GNP has such a convenient property, but for other types of graphs that are not like that random, uh, pseudo random, you, you need to show some, sort of similar property to be able to do uh, this algorithm, basically. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, and the, any other questions? Yeah, I, I might maybe have a, a possibly very stupid question about the adversarial model. Mm -hmm. So you were saying that the three goals that you described uh, are no longer the same for this um, uh, adversarial problem. So yeah. do, I, do I understand correctly that the issue is that if you are an adversary, you can really find a kind of a set such that um, outside of the set, there are some um, nodes with a very good connection towards the, the set that you plan to, and therefore there's a even larger clique than you, you planned there? Mm, yes, exactly. So for example, we can, so adversary can choose K vertices such that uh, they all have a common neighbor. So this now, the, the clique, we already have a K plus one clique, and the planted K clique is not maximum one. It's not maximum clique. And also, it may happen that there are many k clicks in the original graph, and the adversary just chose one of them. So we cannot distinguish between this particular click and all the others. So, and yeah, and if you want to find any k click again, there may be a lot of them. And for example, we can choose k vertices such that like k minus like uh, one minus small of one k vertices, they have lots of different neighbors that we can complete to get a k click. Uh, but but like uh, so they are again very similar, but they have all the like some minor connection to the set that we chose. And I think in our paper we even provide some examples and thoughts on this, like so why all these goals are different. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question, and then we'll be. Uh, well, if there are no more questions, then we're right on time. So thank you everyone for participating in this uh, section. So let's thank the speakers um, and also the other, yes? One second before everyone leaves, I would like to invite you all to our social meeting, which uh, starts right in the second in uh, the Zoom link. You also find it in the details schedule. So feel free to join. Okay, thank you, Florian, for...
for the invitation. So the link is here. I guess we'll leave the room open for a little bit longer for people to, to join the meeting. Yes. It's awesome uh, the yes. details. Good. Uh, good. Thanks everyone for participating. So uh, hope to see you in one of the future sessions of the conference. Mm, good.